Hello and welcome to Someone's Gotta Make It. On this show, I'm gonna be talking to the founders and leaders behind businesses that make products you encounter all the time but never really think about. And we're gonna talk about how these folks overcame their growing pains. And in speaking to a lot of these people, I learned that some of the challenges they encountered in building their businesses are the same challenges and growing pains that we all encounter in growing our businesses. So if you're trying to grow a business of your own right now, listen up, you're gonna learn some practical strategies that might help unblock you from what you're struggling with right now. My name is Ben Goldstein, I'm your host. I'm also the VP of Marketing at Nutshell. We're a CRM and email marketing platform. We help thousands of companies all around the world get organized and automate the little stuff so they can focus on what's important, which is building stronger relationships with your buyers. On this episode, you know those promotional tents you see at food festivals or outdoor music festivals or art fairs? Well, someone's got to make them, right? And for a lot of businesses, that someone is Matt Bullock. Matt is the CEO and president of Tentcraft. Matt founded Tentcraft in 2007 after stints in the Army National Guard and as an analyst on Wall Street. But launching a business was only the first major pivot in Matt's story. We're going to talk about how he nearly left his business to pursue the life of a tech founder on the West Coast. We're going to talk about the sudden impact of the COVID pandemic and the pivot Matt had to make to keep his business afloat when public events were suddenly no longer a thing. And we're also going to talk about how you juggle being the boss at work with being a dad and a husband at home. Work-life balance, very important stuff, but not always easy as it turns out. I thought this was a wonderful conversation. I hope you enjoy it as well. Here's me with Tentcraft president, Matt Bullock. Thanks for being on the show, Matt. Hey, Ben, thank you for having me, and congratulations on all your success at Nutshell. Oh, thanks so much. Before you started Tentcraft, you were working as an analyst on Wall Street. As the story goes, you hated your job. What did you hate about it? I, I had never had a traditional internship. All through college, I worked as a firefighter for the U.S. Forest Service, and I really wanted to be a smoke jumper, but I didn't get hired. Those are the wildland firefighters that parachute out of airplanes into remote wildfires. Oh, yeah. University of Virginia, which is where I went to undergrad, sent a lot of people to Wall Street. I was late in the interview cycle, but it seemed like something that everyone else was doing, and it seemed like a good foundational career move to get some experience at an investment bank. And it, it just wasn't for me. Why was that? Was there a specific moment working at that job when you thought, I'm done with this, forget it? Investment bankers love to exaggerate their hours, but the hours did suck. Mm. There were probably two moments. I loved working with smart people. And I loved the other analysts because we, we sat in a bullpen where all the analysts that were one, two, or three years out of college sat together. W one of the moments was when a vice president, which isn't really that senior, called me at 12.15. I can't remember if it was during the week or on the weekend and wanted me to go back to work. Past midnight. Past midnight. Wanted me to go back to work because uh, to get some obscure piece of information that was only accessible on the system because she wanted it first thing tomorrow morning. And just the expectation was absolutely that no matter what I was doing, of course I would go back to work. And then the other piece was that I think I was doing it and I was an okay analyst and I could do it. But I spoke to one of my fellow analysts that just loved it. And he was there all night because his model had a reference error and he was so happy to tell us the next morning about, hey, I found it and I was here till four in the morning. But to him, being a financial analyst, you could tell it was almost like a video game mm -hmm. where he solved the problem and he figured out what was wrong and it was great and he was excited. And I was like, man, nothing about this story makes me excited, nor do I want to do that. And I worked with some great people. I worked with some jerks, but I just knew that I wasn't destined for success at an investment bank. Give me the short version of how Tentcraft got started. What was the original vision and, and what kind of customers were you serving at the beginning? Short version of how I started the company is a friend from the bank, from Credit Suisse. We had gone to undergrad together, but I actually knew his now wife better than I knew him. His stepfather owns a nationwide digital print company in Traverse City, Michigan called Britain Banners. They've changed their name a few times over the years. Okay. But Paul Britton is his name. Great guy entrepreneurial guy started his company during college and he would come to New York and invite the young analysts out for dinner and drinks. And he always had crazy stories and he'd pick up the tab. And one night over 14 beers, he said, how do you like Wall Street? I said, I hate it. And we got talking and he said, what do you really want to do? And I said, I would love to do something entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. And I had a few ideas, franchising a restaurant, a, a few other things. 
one of my buddies from undergrad was familiar with a chain of drive through liquor stores that are big in the Outer Banks that I'd never even been to. So I was actively investigating entrepreneurial opportunities. Paul Britton basically said, hey, there's a great product. It's a tent system. It's been a page in my catalog. At this point, my team doesn't want to do it. My VP of sales says tents are a waste of time. My VP of manufacturing says tents are non-core, tents are distraction. I think it's a good idea, and I have all this inventory. So if you want to do something entrepreneurial, it'll be your company. I'll bankroll it, and we can help with the printing. So I identified two industries that I really wanted to target initially. It was the rental industry because we have a higher quality product and I thought maybe it would be appropriate for rental. And then what's called the experiential marketing company. Red Bull is a really good example. Red Bull sponsors a lot of events. Red Bull is a German or Austrian company and they don't plan these events directly. They hire marketing agencies that specialize in what's called experiential marketing to plan these events on behalf of their marketing team or, or whatever group. Had zero traction in the rental industry for a number of reasons. I went to the ARA rental show, aggressively bought lists of rental companies. We tried to send them email correspondence and cold call them. And a higher quality pop-up tent just wasn't what they were looking for. We did start to get some traction in the experiential marketing industry. And my first year had one big experiential marketing customer named Pierce Promotions. And so my second year, the goal was to get three more agency customers like a Pierce Promotions. So the idea of doing something entrepreneurial was exciting to you. There wasn't all the risk of launching something completely from scratch. Was there anything about these promotional tents and event structures in particular that appeal to you? Or are you just interested in getting some experience running a business? Initially, I would say that I was just interested in running a business. I like tents as much as the next guy, especially at that point. But it was a means to be an owner and an operator of a small company. I have since come to really appreciate our industry. And I love that we sell to all different kinds of customers. At the agencies, sometimes it's the creative directors that when you meet them face-to-face, -face, they have the three-foot mohawk. <laughs> During COVID, it was hospital administrators or facilities people. But I am proud that we're able to take something off people's plates when, when they're planning an event or medical was, was totally different because let's say advertising agency has an event in Times Square. They need to worry about the permitting and about the weather and about their staff and their samples and the giveaway. And the tents are just one tiny piece. Mm -hmm. And so if we can completely take that off their plate and they can say, hey, Tencraft has it covered. Tencraft is vertically integrated. Tencraft has a ton of experience. That makes me feel good. How long did it take before Tentcraft started building some momentum and the business really started working? We had grown to about $3 million in revenue. The mix then, which is still our non-COVID mix, is about 50% as a result of our outside sales efforts. And these are direct to agencies and well-known brands that plan their own events. So if you think of Under Armour being involved in the NFL Combine or Geico that sponsors a lot of outdoor events, about half our revenue comes that way. The other half originates with our primarily pay-per-click efforts. Mm -hmm. And, and so we'd gotten to about $3 million in revenue, but at that point, I was in my late 20s, living in a small town in northern Michigan that I moved from Manhattan, and I was missing bachelor parties and family mm -hmm. reunions and friend activities. At that point, I was a 40% partner, and I applied to business school, not really being sure if selling tents in northern Michigan is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Right. Yeah, and I, I want to get to that in a second. But first, just looking back at your career pivot from analyst on Wall Street to business owner— did that transition immediately make you happier? Was it everything you wanted it to be? I really loved what I was doing at work, but living in a small town in Michigan in my mid-20s was tough. And, and so I kind of flip-flopped where I loved living in New York when I wasn't working, but I was working 90% of the time, but the 10% of the time I wasn't working was awesome. And then when I started Tentcraft, I loved what I was doing professionally, but then it was a little sleepy when I wasn't at work. I heard an analogy that running a small company, if you think about a small company as a barrel of wine or a barrel of beer, and you have these vertical slats in the barrel, and every slat represents a different facet of your company. So for me, it might be our outside sales capability and our inside sales capability and our marketing and our sewing capacity and our print capacity. But I can only hold as much revenue as that lowest slat. We're selling like crazy, but we can only produce half that. It doesn't work. And my job as a small business owner is to come in every day and look at that barrel and turn the barrel and try to figure out what that low point is and bring it up and work on it. Being a small business owner very much fulfills my need for variety, 
maybe plays to me being a little bit ADD at times where I can jump around and focus on what I think really needs focus on and then move on to the next topic. And I, I want to get in now into that next pivot in your story, which is back in 2011, you took a break from Tentcraft to attend the Graduate School of Business at Stanford. So first of all, why did you go back to school? What were you hoping to learn? I, I was really unsure about my next career move. And that was both professionally and, and personally. I had been dating my now wife. We had done a little bit of on again, off again. And, and it was at the point when a lot of my friends that I worked at Credit Suisse with or people I'd gone undergrad with were going to business school, either to be promoted or to switch careers. One of the jokes about business school is that everyone changes careers for their internship and then goes back to what they were doing after they graduate, which I certainly saw a lot of in my class. I, I thought at the point that, that maybe I would be interested in a tech startup. I had some mm -hmm. friends living in San Francisco. My family had since moved to the West Coast. And, and so I went to Stanford thinking at the time that I would probably end up at a tech company. And, and you said you're in your late 20s when this is happening, right? Yep. Did you feel out of place in any way at Stanford? I mean, you'd already lived a lifetime since the last time you were in the school between the military and your business experiences. Like, how did that feel? I was a little bit older than the average MBA student. Mm -hmm. I think I get along pretty well with a lot of people, but th there was definitely a cohort of folks at Stanford that did four years at Bain or McKinsey or BCG, and then the consulting firm was paying for their MBA. It, it was just a different track th than I was on, and so I really fell in with the international group at Stanford. We would play soccer next to graduate student housing. They had this beautiful field where there's a building now. And so my second year, it, it was just the, this great group of guys, and uh, it was eight guys from eight different countries. And I liked playing soccer with those guys, but a lot of those guys also had more entrepreneurial experience. They were a little bit older, or they came from a family business, and it was just a different mindset than maybe someone that graduated from Yale, did two years of banking, two years of private equity, and then went, went straight to Stanford. So yeah. I, I loved my classmates, but I really related to the folks that were international or a little bit more entrepreneurial. So who was running Tentcraft while all this was happening? So I, I had a, a great number two who has since gone on to start his own real estate business. But uh, we were also a lot smaller. When I got into Stanford, which was my dream school, my, my partner at the time had said, we had a buy-sell agreement established. And he said, if you just want me to buy your equity, you can go to Stanford, not take any loans, and just go on and do whatever else you want with your career and don't forget about us. Or if you want to keep your equity will adjust your salary, and maybe you'll want to come back. And so I elected to keep my equity thinking it was basically a free option, that mm -hmm. if I could sell it for X in 2011, I could probably sell it for X or maybe even more because we had a formula based off earnings in 2013. But after my internship at Apple, I realized that working at a big company probably wasn't for me. I also didn't have an idea that I was so excited about, that I was ready to, to go all in on, that I was authentically passionate about. The companies that seemed to be successful were people that were really passionate about what they were doing. I didn't have a good enough idea, bottom line. Mm -hmm. And I started to really think that there was a lot of potential in U.S. manufacturing because U.S. manufacturing had really been written off. My now wife wanted to stay in San Francisco, but I said, hey, if, if we can go back, give me three years, and I'd be there going to start to scale 10 craft, and we're going to grow, and it's going to be exciting, we're going to do great things, or I'll just go and find another job or try to start something else. So in, in 2013, it was very much kind of a, had a three-year window to either start to grow 10 craft, or I needed to choose a different path. So ultimately, you went out to California, you decided yeah, being a tech founder isn't for you. But still, were there any lessons that you took from your time out in California between grad school and Apple? Absolutely. The focus on culture and the, the average manufacturing company in Michigan looks a lot different than the average tech company in San Francisco. I definitely thought there were some cultural elements that I could apply to my company that I think we have. And probably one of my favorite compliments is when people come into Tentcraft and they see we have a slide going from the top level to the bottom level, this 20-foot custom curly slide, and the ping pong tables, and the, the kayaks for free employee rentals, and the stand-up paddle boards, and the nice courtyard with tables that the Wi-Fi reaches. Probably one of the highest compliments is that people say, wow, this looks like a tech startup, or this looks like Google. And I fundamentally believe that work doesn't have to be brutal and soul-crushing and just miserable. And there are things that I can do as a business owner responsible for the space and for the facilities that make work a lot more enjoyable. And the reality is I, I spend more time at work than I do with my family or with any of my hobbies. And so I want 
a nice place to work. And it absolutely helps us with attraction and retention of employees, having kind of, quote unquote, like a cool office. They say that the company you start with is never the company you end up with. And you experienced this pretty dramatically a couple of years ago. Tell me what happened to your business when the COVID pandemic started impacting live events back in around March of 2020. Our business originally fell off a cliff. We had orders that we were halfway through production that customers told us to stop because they weren't going to pay us for it. The South by Southwest technology conference and music festival was canceled. They were pretty early. Then the NCAA canceled the the basketball tournament, which uh, even though that's obviously indoor, there are a lot of fan villages and product Mm -hmm. sampling and sponsorship opportunities. And, And so normally March and April is heading into our busy event season and everything was canceled. It was pretty harrowing. I was nervous. It was early March. I I had been following the developments with COVID pretty intently, both because of the impact on my business and because I'm a news nerd anyway, but also because I was going on a cruise in late January. I'm not really much of a cruise guy, but my dad was getting remarried and he basically said, we want our family and Linda's family to go on a Disney cruise and we'll pay for it. So so I was following COVID because I, I think the Diamond Princess was stranded at that point. And and so I had an inkling that it was going to be a little bit more serious than most folks thought it was at the time. And by early March, I wrote a, a Saturday afternoon email to the whole company that the team later framed for me, which I've got right here. I, I basically said, this COVID-19 virus is real, it's here. It's going to affect all of us. It's going to affect our company for years to come. Fun events that use our pop-ups are all going to stop as people either won't want to or won't be allowed to mingle with strangers. The event business may never come back in the same way. We together are going to completely retool the company to focus on supporting health and medical applications. Our products are going to be in demand and will save lives. We have about a month of work to do in the next week. The message in my email was, our only priority right now is to focus on medical applications. And if what you're doing doesn't pertain to medical, stop doing it. I don't want to hear about it. 100% of our resources need to be focused on medical. And because of that, we had about a three-week head start. When the pandemic really hit and things closed down, we already had products in the field. We already had one big customer in the VA. Because I'm a veteran, we were already in the VA's purchasing system, which allowed us to stay open when basically every other manufacturing company that wasn't deemed essential had to shut down. And that really kept us afloat because we were working on medical orders for the VA when everyone else was shut down. And then by the time things started to open up again, and then community healthcare organizations and hospitals and other essential manufacturers that wanted to screen people before they came in the building, we were already in the market with products and we had supply because I had elected to vertically integrate in 2015, 2016. So a lot of our competitors that were just importing from China couldn't get anything, and we just bought as much aluminum and as much plastic and as many of the components as we can, basically thinking that the companies that made our aluminum were going to shut down because automotive was shut down. So the only way for us to have a fighting chance was to get as much of it as we could. And my thinking really was that we could handle missing goals. We couldn't handle a zero. But if, if we didn't have enough aluminum, we couldn't ship any tents. So we made a big bet in inventory and it was kind of, well, if the company is going to go bankrupt, we're going to really crash and burn with a lot of inventory on hand. You know, we're not going to kind of wither away without a fight. Which seems like a brilliant move in retrospect. I wanted to back up for a second. When you sent that email to your staff saying, hey, stop working on everything that's not related to medical, how did your team react to that message? Was, Was there any resistance from them? Mostly positive, mostly people... I I think felt like they they knew exactly what we needed to work on, which is what I can hope for in every quarterly planning where people know what the most important thing is. I I think there was some resistance with projects that were kind of half done that people wanted to continue to work on. But I I was really clear that there needs to be a 100% focus on medical. It's the most important. Everything else can wait. I would say it was about 90 to 95% positive. I will say that we did do a layoff early on, Mm -hmm. and this is a lesson that I've had to continue to teach myself as a business owner, where we were about 80 people at the time, and we laid off seven people. And it's so heart-wrenching, but my thought was that we're laying them off an environment with the best unemployment benefits that any of us will ever see in our lifetime. And the, the people that were laid off were the ones that were had attendance issues, or were on write up, or were culturally just not a fit. And when that happened, the team did better. It's just that cliche about one bad apple really does ruin the bunch. When you have people that were great, 
seven years ago when you had 11 people, but they just haven't scaled. And then maybe they're in a, a management position because they were the first artist that you hired. So then when you have five or six other artists, the first person is the manager, not because they ever should have been the manager, but just because they'd been there the longest. And so that early part of COVID, as sad and as heart-wrenching as it was to, to do a layoff, I thought that we had to get payroll smaller and it was an opportunity to call the herd a little bit with some people that just weren't a fit anymore. What impact did the COVID pivot have on the revenue of your business? We had our revenue-wise our two highest years. I'm, I'm not uncomfortable talking about, but obviously there, there, there's been worldwide death and devastation and so, so much heartbreak as a result of this pandemic. And it, it's just been hard on everyone, but th there was massive demand for products to be used outside to shelter people from the elements. And if you look at the overall economy, two of the biggest sectors of the economy, which is the healthcare sector, the education sector, were buying products for outdoor classrooms, for medical screening, for inventories, for quarantining. We had very high revenue years, but of non-reoccurring revenue. The VA bought $5 million from us in 2020. It really could be a zero in 2022. And so I, I have to remind my team that, yes, our ability to react validated the decisions to vertically integrate, but we weren't geniuses. In many respects, the ball bounced in our direction. If we had a chain of restaurants or if we were an amusement park, like what would we have done? We would have had to do something else. So we, we were able to react because we were maybe more prepared than others. But this pushing people outside wasn't something that we did. So are things returning to normal for Tentcraft in the sense of, are you back to making tents for exhibitors at music festivals and sporting events like you were pre-COVID? It really started last year. And, and so after 2020, we budgeted for a down year in 2021, thinking that medical would start to tail off before events came roaring back. And we ended up having another really strong year in 2021 with all these stimulus packages that went to municipalities and states and hospital systems, they've been buying not only for current needs, but for future needs, realizing that they were caught unprepared for an emergency situation. So we, we did a, a big order for the state of Kansas that they sent some of our larger tents to every county in Kansas to the county health department. We're just finishing a similar order for the state of West Virginia. And we're off to a good start. Events are coming back but it's not the big, splashy nationwide events. And I think that's because the brands are still very hesitant to sponsor an event that could later turn into a super spreader event. The normal big advertisers, Pepsi, haven't wanted to put their name on whatever big concert. And it takes a while to, to plan these things. So we are budgeting for a down year. We're off to a good start because Q1 was stayed busy with medical and events are coming back, but it's smaller orders. It's not the, it's not the, it's not the real big stuff. You got through a pretty dramatic disruption because you recognized an opportunity to serve a different kind of customer. I know you say the ball bounced in your direction. What advice would you give to businesses that are considering a pivot of their own or they're faced with a situation that is forcing them to change direction? I've thought a lot about this. I think the key is, for us, we had to keep moving forward. It's trial by movement is one thing that I heard or I said, I probably stole it from somewhere. But for us, if we didn't do anything, we would have been dead in the water. As I said earlier, we can miss our sales goals, but we can't afford to keep 80 people on if we're shipping zero. In our traditional event business, it truly was a zero. And so when you commit to trial by movement, in lean manufacturing, they call it um, a PDCA cycle, which is a plan, do, check, adjust cycle it's going to be sloppy and you're going to make some mistakes and you're going to do some things that don't work. We created a number of new products. We created drive-through screening shelters and then we created a hospital cot using tent parts that could was collapsible and it was not as nice as a hospital bed, but nicer than a camping cot and we sold zero of them. And we spent time and engineering resources developing this cot that we said, hey, we're selling all these tents for medical treatment. Maybe people also need cots and it turns out they just didn't. But instead of beat ourselves up on that, what are we trying next? Winston Churchill had a great quote. I, I don't want to say that we're going through hell, but his quote was, if you're going through hell, keep going. Yep. And I, I just love that. You just have to keep moving. And last thing you can do is, is, is stop. You want to get to the other side of it. And so I, I think we had organizationally just had this bias towards action and we need to do something. We can't overanalyze it to death. Like, just do it. 
And if evidence suggests that you're going in the wrong direction, then stop doing it and do something else. But you have to do something. That's great advice. I know company culture is really important to you, Matt. And so I want to talk about that for a moment. In your opinion, what does an ideal, healthy company culture look like? People talk about culture a lot. A lot of people, I think, struggle to even define what culture is. And so the definition of culture that I heard that I liked the most was that culture is the accumulation of everyone's actions. How we relate to each other. If you're yelling at people or swearing at people or not coordinating across departments or or, or just being a jerk, like the accumulation of everyone's individual choices is your culture. And, And so when we have interns, we have interns every year and seasonals every year because our tent business is busiest in the summer. If we have 15 or 20 interns or seasonals, I I tell them, it's like, you guys are a huge part of the culture. You guys represent 10 or 15 or 20%, whatever it is, of of the company culture and and how you behave and how you act. And if you treat people with respect, um, and if you communicate, and if you demonstrate teamwork, like that is our culture. Because everything that we do either builds the company culture and reinforces what we call our core values, or it detracts from the culture. Tell me a little more about the principles or, or the processes of all this. What do you specifically do to establish a culture that allows employees to show what they're capable of and do their best work and, and even make their own career pivots if they need to? One book that really influenced me was called Paul Aker's Two Second Lean. And we are a manufacturer. Lean manufacturing originated from the Toyota production system. So we, we try to use lean manufacturing principles. But in my opinion, People that talk about lean can very quickly go off course because lean originated from Toyota and everything is a Japanese word and everything's an acronym. It can get very complex. And the average shop employee, let's say, their eyes are just going to roll back in their head. So Paul Akers wrote this great book that I have behind me called Two Second Lean. And he said that lean is about fixing what bugs you. And it's that simple. And every employee from me as the CEO to someone that just started a week ago, there's something that bugs them And Paul Aker's message is, he said, make a two-second improvement. Just make Mm -hmm. it a tiny little better. And if you make a little improvement every single day, then at the end of the year, the sum of these thousands of improvements is that things are just absolutely transformed. We call our improvements, make it better videos, make it better as our company purpose. But when someone makes an improvement, we ask them to videotape it and share it with the team, which is what Paul Aker's recommends. I was skeptical when I read it in his book, But Paul said, or or actually another company that I observed said that when you actually make the improvement videos and share them, it allows you to celebrate, that's number one, accelerate and cross-pollinate the improvements throughout the company. And so we show these improvement videos that are morning huddle. And so Ben, if you made a video because you figured out a better way to get guests ready for your podcast, first of all, everyone claps, right? They say, hey, we have a continuous improvement culture. Ben's a part of the team. Our market's always changing. Our customers are always changing. We're actively involved in making the company better because you know you make an improvement and you say, hey, I sent a package with a microphone to Matt. And then maybe someone else says, well, what if you also sent a laminated card with how he should set it up and sent a link to a, a podcast that went really well or, or one that didn't? So you get other people engaged in making that improvement better and better. And then the cross-pollinate is where you get someone in a different department that says, hey, we had that same issue and we could use that same idea and make it our own. I require, as the business owner, as the CEO, I require four improvements per year from every employee at Tentcraft. We make it as easy as possible for people to make improvements. We say it can be a little improvement. It can be a big improvement. A whole team can make one improvement. So if the whole sewing fabrication team works together on an improvement, they all get the checkbox. And then last year, we opened it up to say that you can do an improvement at home, right? If we talk about having an organized workspace and you organize your garage because it used to be a mess and now you know where all your tools are, that counts. Because I I think business owners, we have the ability to influence our employees and make employees' lives better. And that's not just through raises and bonuses. That's through leadership opportunities or teaching them skills that they may not have learned in school. When we started this push, it was great, right? Because there was so much that bugged people and people I think were excited to go ahead and make the videos and get credit for it. And then after a year and a half, two years, it felt like I was pulling teeth to get the videos, right? Where I said, hey, all I want are four videos per year. And at the end of the quarter, we're bugging people. And so I got up in front of the company. I said, listen, like, 
I hate bugging you for the videos. You don't want me to bug you for the videos, but I feel really important that the way the company gets better is when you individually make it better. So here's what we're going to do. I only pay bonuses and I only give raises to people that do their improvement videos. So it's up to you. I'm not going to ask you about it. We're keeping track. But if you don't get a Christmas bonus, you tell your wife and you tell your kids because you didn't take the 30 seconds that everyone has their phone on them anyway just to think about how to make the company better. And now people are a lot better at their videos. And I would say we're not jerks about it. If someone is late, we'll let people make two the next quarter because the fundamental point is to have an improvement mentality and have that culture of continuous improvement, not just to check the box. You're probably wishing you hadn't asked me about this. No, this is wonderful stuff. This is gold, Matt. The reality is we have CNC machines, right? I'm not an engineer. I don't even know how to turn on the machines. I don't know how to turn on the printers. There's a 0% chance that I'm going to go down to our metal fabrication team and tap Bill on the shoulder and say, hey, Bill, I saw you machining this part. And I thought maybe if you used a different router, or I just don't know how to do it. I could never help Bill be better at his job technically than he already is. So all I can do as a business owner is create a culture where Bill not only feels obligated to make improvements, but he feels empowered to make improvements and he wants to make improvements because everyone else around him is making improvements. What's the hardest lesson you've had to learn in terms of managing people at a growing business? I touched on it a little bit earlier, but when we were a startup, you know, when we were four people or five people, when we hired, I was just so excited that someone would agree to work for Tenkraft. And then as we grew and we had a layer of, of team leads and then department leads and, and middle managers, sometimes the people that ended up as a team lead weren't in that spot because they wanted to be a manager or because they were good at, at being a manager. They were just there the longest. As some of those early people have maybe transitioned into other roles or even transitioned out of the company, that was really tough for me initially, because when, when I started the company, I thought the goal was zero turnover, that Ben and I are working together and we're always going to work together and we're going to be this happy family. And I, I have since come to realize that some turnover is good. There's a natural level of turnover that's just healthy for the organization. And if Tencraft can be a stepping stone to someone's next adventure, or if they really want to be in Portland, Oregon, or they're on the sales team, but they really want to be a sales manager and we don't have a spot... But because Tentcraft has been growing and they have, we have a good reputation, they were able to position themselves for a sales management position at another company. We need to celebrate that and prepare for it. And then that gives us a, the opportunity to promote someone from the floor into a sales role. The hardest lesson for me has been to go from thinking that zero turnover is the goal to just recognizing that a company is kind of a living, breathing organism and there are going to be changes and, and people are going to come and have an impact and then and maybe move on and that's okay. And then maybe they move on and maybe they come back, but I can't keep everyone in a little box and never let them grow or learn. Last October, you appeared at a fulfillment event in Traverse City and you said something that really struck me. You said, sometimes you feel like you're a better boss than you are a father. So I have two sons. I certainly feel like there are times when all my strategic thinking and all my mental energy goes into my job and my family just gets whatever is left, unfortunately. So tell me about what you were feeling or experiencing when you said you sometimes feel like you're a better boss than a father, because I think a lot of people listening right now can relate to that. Ben, I wish I had it figured out. To use a very specific example, like I never yell at work. I, I think I've maybe raised my voice one time in 15 years at work, and it was kind of a, a, a screwy situation. And I yell at the kids all the time. Like, I, I probably would have yelled at them this morning, but I had that breakfast appointment. That's not the type of dad that I want to be, and it's not the type of boss that I want to be. Because I, I know that if, if I went around yelling at people at, at Tent Craft, that would contribute to cultural degradation. So that's just one little example. But then I think at work, I'm trying to mentor, and I'm trying to teach, and I'm trying to set the direction. And then, and I'm at work a lot. And then when I go home, I think you said it very well. Sometimes what's left over or the, the kids don't want to follow my strategic vision of what I think we should be doing or right. you know, the family's going to do this great work project and we're going to work together. And two of them are melting down. I do think balance is important. And I do think that being a dad is my most important job. And I want to be a good dad and I'm working on it and struggling with it. I think the reality is everyone is nice to you once you've re reached a certain level of authority. Yeah. And my direct reports listen to me and do what I ask of them. And my contractors listen to me. They want me to keep paying them. 
And then you get home and it's like your wife and kids don't have the same incentives, I guess. Right. Maybe that's how business owners get addicted to the job sometimes. But what strategies do you use to make sure that there is a balance between your personal, your professional lives, and you're not just pouring everything you have into your job? So I, I did join a professional group called Young Presidents Organization. And I, throughout my life, have found enormous value in peer networks. And so when I was at business school, those were my Stanford buddies that we still communicate regularly with. But then Young Presidents Organization is a network of business owners. It's essentially my board of directors. We get together once a year and do a planning retreat. And it's not focused on our business, it's focused on our lives. And when we started doing it, the idea that most business owners spend a lot more time planning for their business than they ever do for their lives. And then their lives just happen by chance with whatever time is left over. And so I'm trying to be more intentional about planning my life and making that one-page plan, updating the one-page plan, and then being held accountable on the one-page plan. I'll, I'll give you two kind of nuggets. My dad is a private pilot. He's loved flying. You know, he, he has probably had his private pilot's license for 25 years. And so a few times I've thought that maybe it would be fun to learn how to be a pilot I, I just am not at the right point in my life with young kids and with work being busy and with you know trying to race from work to go to a flying lesson. And uh, so one of my YPO guys, this was a few years ago, said, you've had a goal, a one-year goal of being a pilot on your sheet for the last three years. It's like, you either need to do it, it's not that hard, or take it off the list because I'm sick of hearing you talk about it every single year and then not do it. Like It's either a priority and you're going to make it happen or it's not, but you're pissing me off. <laughs> And that was actually really helpful feedback. And then when I thought about it, you know what? I actually don't really want to be a private pilot right now. Like it seems like one more thing to have to work on or study for. And it, it just, it wasn't really a goal. And having another peer hold me accountable to simplify my life was helpful. But another guy that, that I heard talk had this great kind of end of life vision that I thought was just so powerful. And, and he said one of his goals for his life was to be able to ski with his grandkids. And so skiing with your grandkids, it seems like just a cliche, right? Oh, wouldn't that be nice? But he said, if you dig a little bit deeper, skiing is an active sport. So I'm 41. Am I making the right choices with my diet and with my workout regimen? And am, am I taking care of myself to where I'll be able to ski in 30 years or 40 years? That's one piece. Skiing is freaking expensive. I, I went skiing earlier this year. Lift tickets are 180 bucks. Am, am I making the financial decisions now? Am I saving? Am I putting Tincraft in a position to where I'll be able to take my kids and my grandkids skiing and pay for it? Am I going to be financially able when I'm whatever age to, to take everyone skiing? And then there's a relationship component, right? If, if my daughter hates me and hasn't spoken to me in 10 years, then I'm probably not going to take the grandkids skiing. And so it's, it's prioritizing my relationship with my kids and hopefully their kids to have that be important and invest in it to where when I'm 80, I can go skiing with the grandkids. So I just, I loved that image where it's like, oh, skiing with the grandkids, like seems nice. But then when you really peel back the layers, there's stuff that I need to be doing now in order to, to make that happen. If you could go back to day one of your business back in 2007, what's one piece of advice you would give yourself that could have saved you a lot of time, money, or effort? Probably this element of trial by movement and that there have been books written about it with lean startup or growth hacking, but just an idea that you need to try some things. And with incomplete information, you can never have a perfect plan. But if you think about growing the company as a staircase and every step that you take, you can see a little bit further. I think early on with the company, I tried to plan things too much or tried to think 10 chess moves ahead. And sometimes you, you just can't do that because you're dealing with too many variables. I would kick myself in the butt and say, just start figuring it out and just start going and, and then make adjustments because you're never going to have the perfect plan in the beginning. Okay, last question. Let's say you're at a party and you want to impress people with a piece of trivia about the tent and structure business. What nugget do you pull out? People normally aren't very interested in the tent and structure business. <laughs> you got to make them interested. A piece of trivia related to what the pandemic did to our business, our mm -hmm. largest size, which is an eight by four meter pop-up tent. So our largest size of pop-up tents. In 2019, we sold 17 of them. And then in 2020, we sold 1,200 of them. <laughs> and you know, the, j just the shift in demand that happened almost overnight to larger tents for the screening, for drive-through testing, the magnitude of that change, I think is pretty interesting. 
That's all I got. Thanks so much for being on the show, Matt. Ben, thanks for inviting me. And uh, I enjoyed chatting with you. That was my conversation with Matt Bullock. Thanks so much to Matt for being here. Again, I'm Ben Goldstein. I'm the VP of Marketing at Nutshell. Nutshell is a simple and affordable CRM that helps thousands of B2B organizations around the world get organized. We know if you're a small business owner, there's a point where Google Docs and spreadsheets just don't cut it anymore, and that's where we come in. We help B2B organizations of all kinds get off spreadsheets and start tracking their contacts and leads so they can drive more revenue. Every Nutshell subscription comes with unlimited contact and data storage, as well as live access to our friendly Michigan-based support team, starting at just $16 a month. Visit nutshell.com to start a 14-day free trial and use the coupon code POD20 when you purchase to get 20% off your first year subscription. That's all for now. Special thanks to our executive producer, Seth Ressler at Community Marketing Revolution. Thanks to my co-producer, Ashante Clemens. And thank you for listening. Until next time.